Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I think at some point, just about everybody that walks this earth has dreamed of searching for buried treasure. Am I right? Have you had that pirate dream? I, there's just something undeniably exciting about the idea of finding a treasure chest filled with gold doubloons and jewel-encrusted crowns and, and pirate daggers and, and other various doodads, knickknacks, and accoutrements. I, but not everyone gets the opportunity to go on a quest for hidden booty. See, you need to have grit to go on these trips. You have to fit in with the pirates, but, but above all, you need the tools for the job. For starters, you need an eye patch. I don't think you should be allowed to go searching for hidden treasure without an eye patch. You need a shoulder parrot that will repeat what you've said back to you and let you know how ridiculous you sound when you're talking like a pirate. Right, yep, he's definitely going drinking for treasure. Right. <laughs> You need the parrot. You need a shovel. And I was told by someone in the early service, I forgot, you need a peg leg. This is important for pirating. Now, so if I had the eye patch, the parrot, the shovel, and the peg leg, I should be able to go and dig up some hidden treasure, right? I, I could just go right into the backyard of the church and just start digging, and I would find this, this big wooden chest, right? No? Well, that's disappointing. Okay. So what am I missing? I need something else. I, I need, oh, we've got someone in the back, but you were here, Skylar. You heard this this morning, so you can't cheat and help. My kid, just incorrigible. A, a map, right? So, so I could go get a map of Edmund, and I'd be able to just open it up and, and look for the, the treasure chest in the, in the bottom part. And, no. What do I need on the map? An X. I need a big black, or since we're pirates, it could be red, a black and red X in the middle of the map to tell me where to go and dig for the treasure. Because we all know X marks the spot, right? Right? So, so if I found that, I could go out back. If the X was in the backyard, I could just yell, yar, and my parrot would go, yar, and I would be able to find the treasure. This is good. X is where we find the treasure. Well, this week, watch how I make this segue. This week in our Lenten series on the crosses of Lent, we're going to learn about the saltier cross, which is shaped like a big letter X, and why it is that the saltier cross symbolizes humility, which is a very real treasure in the Christian life. Now, Jesus taught and demonstrated humility for us. This is shown really well in the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter, when Jesus asks his disciples, who do these people say that I am? And they have all kinds of responses. They say, John the Baptist, or, or Isaiah, or Jeremiah, or any of the other prophets of the Old Testament. But then he asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter, God love him, Peter, just jumps right up to the front and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And while this is right, Peter still had the idea that Jesus being the Christ meant something drastically different from what it actually meant. So when Jesus told the disciples that he was sent to suffer and die, Peter tried to turn Jesus away from the plan of salvation. God forbid it, Lord. This will never happen to you. <laughs> Good old Peter. But Jesus rebukes Peter, telling him that Peter didn't understand God's plan for salvation as well as he thought that he did. Then, just to make sure that everybody understood, Jesus told the disciples that if anyone wanted to come after him, they would have to take up their cross and follow him. See, this is a far cry from, Jesus, let us sit on your left hand and your right hand when you reach your kingdom. This is this is more along the lines of you need to sacrifice and be humble and selfless in the same way that I am if you truly want to follow me. Now, Jesus didn't only teach humility, he embodied it. He practiced it. 
We see this in the account of John chapter 13, when Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God, got up from supper, put a towel around his waist, and started washing his disciples' feet. And again, after the master puts himself in the place of the servant, we have Peter. Oh, quick of tongue and slow of heart, Peter. Say, never shall you wash my feet. Because he hasn't got the idea that Jesus knows better yet. Jesus tells him, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And Peter's not done yet. He says, oh, okay then, God. Well, then don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands and wash my head. Give me a Jesus sponge bath. Bold, sometimes not so quick Peter. But Jesus simply says, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean. So let's let that idea just go off to the side, Peter. We'll pretend you didn't say that. Then he told them, if I, your Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. As we read in Paul's letter to the Philippians, the second chapter, we are to have this attitude in ourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he was in the form of God, didn't see his equality with God as something that he should use to his advantage. Instead, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. And being made to be like man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God has exalted him and given him the name that is greater than every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, Not everyone is going to confess that Jesus is Lord with a happy voice. Some people are going to find out that Jesus is Lord on the last day, and they're going to be dismayed. (laughs) For some people, the name Jesus brings the fear of God. For others, for us, that name Jesus Christ means salvation. Those are both reasons to kneel, but they're very different motivations. One of terror and one of great joy and excitement. Now, Andrew is another example of X marking the spot. The biblical record gives plenty of examples of his humility. Andrew was known as a follower of John the Baptist before he had heard about Jesus. Now, that in itself shows that this man had a humble spirit because we know that John's preaching was preaching of repentance. This guy was spitting hot fire. He was telling people that they did wrong and they needed to repent. And for someone to accept that kind of preaching takes a certain humble and broken spirit. And this is shown through Andrew. Now, when John started preaching Jesus as the Christ, the very Lamb of God, it didn't take very long for Andrew to jump on board and to believe. And when he did come to believe, he was so excited that he brought his brother to meet this Jesus his brother, Peter, loudmouthed Peter. Andrew said, you need Jesus. Come with me. You got to meet this guy. You take him. In fact, Andrew brought so many people to meet Jesus that he gained a nickname in biblical circles, the introducer. Now, a nickname like this only gets given to people who are so humble in spirit that they show people to the importance of Christ, not to the importance of themselves. Traditions about Andrew also demonstrate his humility, especially his death on the saltier cross. Now, tradition holds that Andrew had angered Aegeus, the proconsul of Patras, by his preaching and his miracles because this, this Aegeus had been trying to restore the ancestral pagan cults. And Andrew was kind of getting in the way of that plan. So he threw Andrew in jail. And while Andrew was in jail, the Christian citizens of the area were on the verge of rioting, 
which could only have worked in Andrew's <laughs> best interests to get him out. But Andrew sent word to the people to imitate the patience and humility of the Savior. When he was facing his death, when he would be martyred for his faith, he was to be executed by crucifixion. But Andrew asked the executioner not to crucify him on the Latin cross. That's the cross that Jesus Christ was nailed to. Andrew was so humble that he didn't want to be nailed to the cross that was so dear to him because of his Savior. He didn't want to be put on that level. So his executioners thought about his request and they allowed it and they nailed him to the saltier cross, which being in the shape of the X, I can only imagine would bring about a far more agonizing death when you think about the way that you have to hang there until you pass. But Andrew greeted that cross willingly, even excitedly. He was looking forward to joining his Savior in heaven as his humble, faithful servant. In fact, tradition also holds that when Andrew was brought to the site of his crucifixion, he actually greeted the saltier cross. And, and I, I have the actual quote, historical? <laughs> when he showed up at the site of the saltier cross, he said this, this is beautiful, Hail, precious cross, that has been consecrated by the body of my Lord and adorned with his limbs as with rich jewels. I come to you exulting and glad. Receive me with joy into your arms. O oh, good cross that has received beauty from our Lord's limbs, I have ardently loved you. Long have I desired and sought you. Now you are found by me and are made ready for my longing soul. Receive me into your arms. Take me from among men and present me to my master that he who redeemed me on you may receive me by you. Such beautiful words can only come from such a humble and loving heart. So all Christians in this same way should aim to let an X mark their lives. I'm not asking you to go and get hooked to a saltier cross but are we the kind of people who bring attention to ourselves or people who give all the glory to Jesus Christ? Are we the kind of people who are willing to take up our crosses in life, which means that we do even the hard things that God calls us to do? Or are we happy to sit back and take it easy so that we don't have to risk failing at anything? Do we take for ourselves or do we consider others first? The difference is found in humility. And being a humble follower of Jesus Christ means that we should serve others before being served ourselves. Is this way of living easy when we try to do it ourselves on our own? Absolutely not. It's very hard. But in humbling ourselves, that is, considering ourselves last and considering the love that God has for all of his creation first, it gets just a little bit easier. And in humbling ourselves even further, Understanding that we don't have the strength to love others first, but that the Holy Spirit gives us the strength to do these things if we only ask in prayer, it gets even just a little bit easier. See, humility feeds itself. And the more humble we get, the more the power of God can work within us and through us. We're taught by example that we're to be humble followers of Jesus Christ. We're shown how to be humble. And we know from history that those who are humble are those who lead others to view Christ. And that's greater than any treasure that we could ever hope to find in some wooden box on a sandy beach. Although I can think of a couple of things that wouldn't be bad to find on a sandy beach. This is a treasure that enriches not only our lives, but the lives of everyone we come into contact with as we shine the light of Christ into the darkness of this world. Let X mark the spot on your lives, keeping the cross in your heart and making you a treasure to God our Father, bringing glory to his name and bringing the hearts of others to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.